Salvete Omnes. I'm Jennifer Jarnigan. I'm a Latin teacher in Dallas, Texas. Hi, and I'm Rachel Ash, and I teach Latin in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're going to be talking about images and the power of reflection in the Latin classroom. We have a few topics that we're just going to go through to make sure that we hit everything we want to to go over this topic for you. So we have self-reflection, evaluating your own self to see if you are bringing in enough images to reflect all of your students. We're going to talk about the unreflected in your classroom. We're going to talk about practical solutions that you can take into your classrooms tomorrow. And then just the conclusion of, of our thoughts when it comes to the subject. Our first subject is self-reflection. So Rachel and I both independently um, experienced this quote from Audrey and Rich, and it really resonated with both of us. That's when someone with the authority of a teacher, say, describes the world and you are not in it, there's a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked in the mirror and saw nothing. And that really resonated with me because it's easy to forget sometimes that we are a source of authority to to some of our students and that we really have a represent uh, an obligation to make sure that we are showing them the world that they can see themselves in no we're not erasing any of them um that is not something that i ever want to do i, I i'm so passionate about helping students get interested in the ancient world and enjoy latin and, and to really take ownership of the subject and really um have a positive relationship with Latin and to be empowered by my class. And yet I had never taken the time to think about literally who I'm showing my students in my class every day. Right. I've been teaching for 18 years and definitely at the beginning, I didn't even think about the idea that it might be important for my students to actually see themselves and, and see a reflection of themselves. I thought, you know, look, I like it. So we're just gonna make them like it too. And that was about as far as my mind went on that. But this is an extremely important quote to me, just like you said. So it, um, I don't wanna dwell on it too long, but I encourage everyone watching this to just go back to it and kind of take it apart and think about it and feel it. So, so why take this on? This is, um, for us, it's really interesting because we both came to this from different backgrounds um, um, in our own lives. And right now we're coming to this in different backgrounds in our teaching. So um, right now I am teaching in a very large public school district. Um, we are called a majority minority public school district. I teach in a school which is 70% uh, diverse. Um, and only 30% white. When I'm in my classroom, I don't see a lot of white faces staring back at me, which has honestly been a really great thing. Um, it was great in and of itself. And then what it has done in terms of growth is, is made me realize what a white lens I saw the world through. Cause I would have probably said, oh, but do I really? And then having done this, I have realized how many things um, in the world are produced for a white audience because they don't look right to me anymore when there's a whole world of just white faces in something that's uh, in the media and there are no people of color in that, in that sea. I go, huh, that doesn't look like my classroom every day. So it started to make it actually stand out to me and look different. And I teach currently in a fairly small private school in a suburb of Dallas. Um, we are a private Episcopal school. We are largely white, um, majority white, but not exclusively. Um, and so my students, when they're in school, don't necessarily see a lot of diversity. And depending on, like Rachel said, what you're watching at home and what, what you're seeing in the media can often be a very, you know, majority, if not exclusively white environment. Um, and I think it's really important 
that my students who are not white or who are not Christian or who are not in any majority group um, within the school population can see themselves in what I'm in, in what I'm showing them so that they understand they're included, they belong. I want them to feel lifted up as well. But it also helps my white students, just like Rachel said, become more aware of um, what what they're what is being reflected to them and what what types of representation they're seeing. Um, when I first started being mindful of making more inclusive PowerPoints and um, storytelling materials and things like that that we're going to talk about a little later in this presentation. I actually had a, a fifth grade student raise his hand very, very sweetly um, when we were working through a PowerPoint, um, not a PowerPoint, a packet of materials that I had not made myself, but they were kind of like good for sub plans, you know, like one of those you can get on online and, and give to students when you're going to be out. So we were going back over it when I was in class and he said, Ms. Jarnigan, how come everyone in here is white? And so, yeah, I, I did that. that. Yeah, it, I mean, it was an awesome question. And I did that, you know, world famous teacher move of, well, that's a good question. Why, why do you think that is? <laughs> so I could kind of take a breath and kind of think about what, how I was gonna approach this question, but also kind of see where he was coming from and what he was thinking. And, you know, fifth graders have no guile. They're, they're the most sweet people. And he just said, well, teachers don't typically have a lot of money. And it would cost more money if you had to print things in color. So if you just make everyone just little white clip art circles, and they're all just white, you don't have to print as much. That saves money. And I think that would be, that would be good. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Like, yeah, that, you know, maybe. Um, but then I followed it up with, but how would you feel, you know, how would you feel if you weren't white? And every single person you looked at was white. Would that make you feel like Latin was for you? And they were all like, ooh, I don't know. And I said, but Latin's for everybody, yeah? And they went, yeah. And I said, well, that's why we need to make sure we're not just showing white people. And they were like, yeah. So it doesn't have to be some big production. It wasn't something that I'd ever talked about with kids. It was just the materials I put in front of them. I was trying to be mindful of showing them a lot of different types of people of different abilities, different races, ethnicities, you name it. And uh, kids will notice. It, it does help them kind of open up their world a little bit and look at look at things a little more critically, which is of course one of our goals as educators. Right, I mean, it's a similar thing. Um, you just sort of see it reflected more in the work as we have been more mindful of showing color in our imagery at my school. And I have a large Latin program in my school. I'm one of six Latin teachers. And, um, and we had actually talked before um, one of the other Latin teachers in my school, Bob Patrick, had brought up the, the fact that in one of his classes, he had, um, I think, no white students in this class. And yet when they would draw scenes from the stories, they always drew white people. And he had talked to the student about this. And it was because, well, the Greeks and Romans are obviously white. And he's like, well, honestly, they're, they're not necessarily, they're multi-ethnic. You know, we've, we have people from all over the place, but why not just reflect yourself? Like, who cares? You know, you're just drawing a picture. <laughs> you know, why worry about it? Um, and so it was, it's been interesting because we've had this discussion and, and that really made me start really watching what my kids draw actively closely. And over the last few years, since I've really focused, I mean, I always kind of like, always is a strong word. For years before that, I'd already started lightly focusing on incorporating imagery. Um, but I've really focused on making sure that my imagery incorporates all kinds of uh, people. And I have watched a difference in the way my students draw the people, which will be all kinds of people now. The gods are all kinds of people now. The students are more likely to draw people and gods that reflect themselves as opposed to all of them being white. So that it awesome. matters. Right. So we made a little checklist here. If you're interested in getting more representation and more inclusive imagery in your classroom, sort of some, some, a checklist, if you will, of things to kind of look at. So do you see women 
BIPOC, which are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, and people with disabilities in your classroom? What do you see represented on your walls in terms of the any art you're using, any posters, things like that? And then what images do you use to teach vocab and concepts? Do you include LGBTQIA plus folks in that representation? And if you're curious what that stands for, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, um, queer, intersex, and asexual plus. Um, so I just realized that we put that up there and some people may not know all the terms. So that's a good point. <laughs> but yeah, um, what images do you use? This, this is really important and, and you can go varying levels of, of directing your face display. Um, you can just have images that represent things on your walls. Um, and then you can go full out. I myself have a Black Lives Matter flag and a pride flag on my wall. Um, but I'm also in a public school and I am ready to argue for my right to have those things on my wall. Um, and it really depends on your situation as to whether you could go that far. And I don't know if you could, Jen, so. Yeah, it, it definitely depends on, on your school, on the, what, it, what its philosophy and policies are. You definitely need to be careful with things like that. If you're ever worried, um, if your school has a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, something like that, that they're, they're a great person to reach out to. If you're at a religious school, reaching out to the priest, chaplain, reverend, you know, whoever sort of is over the religious aspects of the school. Um, my mission at my school, which is an Episcopal school, is the belief that everyone is made in the image of a loving God. And that means everybody. It means doesn't matter what your race is, your gender, your, your sexual expression, sexual um, identity, none of it matters. Everyone is made in the image of a loving God and therefore everyone deserves to be represented. Um, and that's something that I feel very comfortable expressing here. And that's something that I know my school stands for. It's in our mission statement. Um, so if you're, if you're ever worried about things like that, really looking at what your school's mission statement is and looking at what you're doing in your classroom and how that reinforces the mission, that makes a pretty bedrock argument for inclusion, regardless of where you are. That being said, you know your community and you know what, you know what is going to be both inclusive, but also not going to um, put you in a situation that could challenge your, your employment. Um, that is sometimes, unfortunately, a concern depending on where you're where you're teaching and, and the type of school you're at and we certainly understand that right sometimes being there for your students is the most important part of it absolutely right so let's talk about who the unreflected are the unreflected um so the who are the unreflected the unreflected are generally uh bipoc uh so black indigenous and people of color Women are usually not reflected as much in a Latin classroom. Uh, LGBTQIA plus. Uh, people with disabilities are often not reflected in a Latin classroom and curriculum. And some of the reasons for this, largely the formation of our canon. Uh, the Roman canon features Roman voices that are male, elite, that are coded as being white. Um, the impact of Romanization and colonization. Um, how many textbooks present the Romans as conquering and civilizing barbarians and these concepts that, um, you know, I think many of us would bristle at if it were framed outside of the Roman Empire, but because that's always the way we've heard Rome talked about, I think it becomes, we kind of don't hear it anymore and don't really think about it anymore, um, but it tends to reinforce a colonizer mentality. There's also a modern whitewashing of the Roman Empire, um, which Rachel sort of mentioned earlier, this assumption that Greeks and Romans were all white when really they were multi-ethnic. Um, and then there, our, our textbooks tend to have really dismissive depictions of slavery um, that may 
make it a little bit cutesy or a little bit like, oh, look at their hijinks. Um, yeah. And it, it sort of glosses over a lot of the realities. And that can lead to um, comfort with um, even play acting a little bit of it, which you don't want in your classroom. Yes, absolutely. Right. So here's some practical solutions that you can have. Um, we have practical solutions and even resources here. So reflecting all students, you can um, select visuals from a wide variety of artists and styles and depictions. And we have some sources for you for this. So don't worry if you're like, how do I even start? We have a start for you. But you know, don't get stuck on your textbook as your only source. Um, there are a lot of places you can get a lot of different imagery to represent. Definitely. And then the idea of when you're, when you're using visuals for vocabulary and storytelling, make sure you're having visuals that reflect all types of people, right? And not every single picture you're going to use is going to have every type of person who exists on planet Earth. That's, that's not a reasonable expectation. And you would, you would spend an entire planning period searching for that, probably. Um, but just over time, cumulatively, you know, make sure that you're reflecting lots of different types of people in your visuals. Great. Don't be afraid to use modern images as well as ancient and Renaissance images. Uh, there's a lot of places you can get. Um, there's comics that are, that are out. There is deviant art, which we'll talk about more in a second as a resource. Um, there are shows and plays. There are a lot of places you can get some modern images. Um, you know, go ahead and include the ancient Renaissance, especially as a conversation with those modern pieces. Definitely. And when you're bringing in these different types of visuals, it's a great idea to critique them and to, to open up scholarship to students, right? Bring in articles that critique monochromy. Expose your students to the scholarship around poly polychromy and the understanding that the ancient world was a vibrant place and that the ancients depicted themselves in an array of skin tones. That a lot of this whitewashing is a more modern idea. But when you look at what the ancients actually produced, you see many more types of people. Right. And on the following slides, we're gonna show you how to do this. So we're gonna show you some of our favorite resources and ideas. So here's how we use images. We introduce and reinforce new vocabulary with images. So if we have some new vocabulary words coming up, let's say um, ambulat, we could use lots of different types of people walking, but we can also use um, people with um, a prosthetic leg walking, um, people moving. Using a walker. Yeah. yeah, using a walker, exactly. So different types of things. You don't have to have just one type of walking, and that's a way to include people with disabilities. Absolutely. Um, we, we use them to provide <laughs> we use them to provide visual support for stories like we've mentioned um, this can help anchor and engage students when you're storytelling but again it's also this way to help open up kids worldviews and to ensure that your students get a chance to see themselves while they're at school right and yeah and just bringing it into like you said, visual support with stories, anchoring and engaging students while storytelling, and then also to help assess students' writing because we're just bringing in those same pictures and we are using these images in all these places that come from great resources. So I'm gonna have, Jen, you go ahead and step in and explain why the inclusive images specifically. Sure. It, it really helps make sure that all of your students are feeling inspired, that they're all feeling empowered, and that they're all feeling affirmed, right? We're, we're sort of pushing back against the idea that there's only one way the Romans looked. There's only one way that Romans thought. There's only one way that Romans existed in the world, right? That's not a realistic understanding of reality of any time. And it's really going to help students understand more deeply and appreciate more fully 
the richness of the ancient world and the richness of the literature and the richness of our archaeological evidence and everything else if they can understand just how many different types of people lived in it and experienced it. Uh, so we picked a couple of examples of this that have come out recently. Um, for example, um, Luvita Mwango said, um, until I saw people who looked like me doing the things I wanted to, I wasn't so sure it was a possibility. We, we plant the seed of possibility. She needed to see actresses like her before she knew that she could be an actress. And our vice president-elect Kamala Harris in, in her speech put it beautifully that she may be the first, but she's not gonna be the last because so many little girls saw her. Um, and that's such an important part point. Then here's another one, this teacher tweeted, you never know how you will connect with a kid. This is why it's important to have a diverse staff so each kid can see themselves in their positive role models. And, and it's a note from a student that says, Dear Miss Holden, I love the way you teach and I love your hair because it is really poofy just like mine, or puffy like mine. It's so sweet. But it's again, it's, it affirms kids when they can see you and they see themselves in you or they see themselves in your materials and your curriculum and what you're sharing with them. It and really does build students up. It just, it matters. Um, I just saw today a video of a kid meeting um, President-elect Joe Biden and um, it was a big important thing because apparently the child has a stutter and he wanted to meet him because he was someone who was successful and who has successfully overcome his stutter and created a great career. And for him to see someone who has overcome that situation and become not just someone who has been successful in life, but actually become a public speaker and representative was a big deal to this kid. So again, this, this, it, it just matters. Absolutely. So, all right. So some places to find these images. So Google is a great place as we all, we all search Google all the time, probably. Um, but, but one thing that you may find yourself falling into, it's a trap that I often fell into. If you're not specific enough or really thoughtful when you're searching, you're more likely to find a lot of, a lot of white faces, regardless of what you're Googling. So sometimes you need to specify non-white ethnicities or specify LGBTQIA plus people, specify people with disabilities. It helps your results become more inclusive and really it, and it's just a way to be mindful when you're looking for representation. Um, because if you allow your search engine to do all the work, it will generally default to a less inclusive array of images. Um, Self-publishing websites like DeviantArt are another great source for images. And then social media, um, you can follow accounts on Twitter or Instagram, for example, that promote inclusive representation. There are some wonderful artists who are very inspired by um, classical art, classical architecture, but they make really vibrant prints where they're representing all of the statues in color. And it's really vibrant and beautiful. Um, and it, it would, really look great in a classroom. Um, and it helps, I think, you know, a classroom is a little bit boring if every single picture is bleached out columns. And, you know, it, at least for me, as I was a really visual kid and being able to see anything with lots of vibrant color really attracted my eye and really captivated me. So it's something that'll, that'll help grab students and really get them intrigued by, by the ancient world. Yeah. And Ancient images, we're not saying not to use them because there's some great ones, especially uh, when you can point to these ancient images and say, hey, look, they're also inclusive because there were more than just white people. Um, so there's the Faye and Mummy portraits, which is a great resource because of the fact that these are actual portraits of people from that time period. Um, there are painted statues and vases representing non-white people. Um, so you can actually look and, and point at these ancient resources just directly. Um, there's also museums, which is where you would get some of these images. Most museums have catalogs and, and exhibits online. There's the Met. The Met's really great about offering images online. Um, the British Museum 
of Art and the British Institute. They're both really good. If you just do a search, you're going to find museums that publish things online. If you look on Twitter, museums have competitions online. So it's it. There's a lot to look at. Just go online. Um, movie shorts. There are a lot of movie shorts that actually celebrate uh, uh, BIPOC identity, show disability, etc. Um, Hair Love uh, received a lot of acclaim recently. It's gorgeous. It's celebrating black hair. Tamara is um, a beautiful movie short about a little girl who is deaf and it includes actual sign language. So um, it is a really good place and the imagery in that it's good for active teaching uh, visually and you can take slot skills from it and use those in class as well. Great. And these are some examples of our own visuals that we've created to use in our class. So this is a Familia Google Slides presentation. In seventh grade, the very beginning of Cambridge, when we're learning Familia vocabulary, um, I really want students to see lots of different family structures, right? And really to the idea that there's not one way to be a family, there's not one way a family looks. Um, and one of the things that I have found given the age group I'm teaching, given the area that I'm teaching in, um, one of the safest ways, in my opinion, to, to really bring in some diversity and some inclusion is I go to pop culture. I use things like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I use Modern Family. I used Fresh Off the Boat, um, which was just a show that my husband and I happened to enjoy. But one of my Asian American students' faces just lit up. He was like, That's, I love that show. And I was like, yeah. Um, and you could just see that it was kind of jazz. Like he wasn't expecting to see this, you know, this family included in this PowerPoint. So, um, and then there are kids who haven't seen the show are like, oh, I, I want to go watch that show. So that's kind of a fun thing. Um, you know, you have to make sure that the shows you're going to, you're going to choose or the movies that you're going to choose are appropriate for the age level that you're teaching. Um, that's, that's sort of the only thing to be aware of there but it's super easy and lots of repetition of family vocabulary. Um, and we're seeing different, just in these, you know, four families I have here, the Simpsons, uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the family from Fresh Off the Boat, and then the families from Modern Family, you're seeing multiple types of family structures. Um, and again, it, it's just reinforcing that idea that there's no one way to be a family. And I think that's so important. You have the multi-generational, you have, you have some divorced families, you have, you know, I think it's so normal to just have the nuclear family re represented. So, you know, it's, it's important to show other options. Absolutely. Okay. So I created a mini project called, you know, ubiquitous Juno across the ancient Mediterranean. And this was actually inspired because I had a student who questioned my use of a deviant art picture of a black Juno on one of our stories. And um, most of my students were really excited about it. Um, but one of my students who was white um, got upset um, and sort of made a snide comment. And I found that interesting. I thought it was a great moment to have a teaching moment because the truth is the Romans didn't see gods as their gods per se. They saw them as kind of a universal thing and, and wherever, and it's the Greek thing too, by the way, this is a Roman and Greek concept, but the, wherever you were, that was sort of how the gods manifested themselves. So it wasn't so much as like, a, oh, these are my gods and these are your gods, but sort of like, oh, this is Juno and this is how we see her and this is how she manifests herself for us and how these are her aspects for us. And um, so I decided to sort of pull all the manifestations of Juno as the different cultures that the Romans had uh, encountered would have seen her and have my students do like a mini like project for that day so that I could kind of drum in, you don't get to decide that I'm showing you the wrong thing. Um, and so what we did is we did like um, each 
I had them separate into groups and I assigned them a version of Juno to research. And so um, it, I based it off of how, uh, how they've sort of, they got to divide into groups they were comfortable with. I usually, when I'm pushing them a little bit, I let them choose their groups because I want them to be with students that they're more comfortable with. Um, and then I sort of based on the groups they were, if they were uh, a group that is more strong in delving into um, research and, and information pooling, those were the groups I gave, for example, Ethiopia, because Ethiopia, um, a lot of its history has been erased and, and sort of um, hidden under other histories, especially because the Romans didn't really like them and the Egyptians didn't really like them. So uh, because of the Romans and the Egyptians not liking them, they, uh, a lot of their history was, was, was covered up. Um, so it's harder to find things about them. Um, so, you know, based on the, the difficulty of finding the information, I based that on who I assigned it to. And then they were on the back of the paper. They, they created a picture depicting the goddess. They put together the symbols, put the name, um, any of her specific aspects. And then I made a wall display from all the different classes so that we had this wonderful display of Juno across the Mediterranean for students all over the school to see afterwards. So that it wasn't just like, hey, the Greek gods are just these white people. That's what we did. Then I teach from Cambridge. And just as a quick aside, Juno's, um, or Rachel's Juno Ubiquitous project would really work well when you're starting Aqua Solis and the different representations of, of the goddess. And when you're teaching about the conflict with the Jewish people and sort of the, the mindset of what God is or who gods are is just being so different from each other that, and so incongruous. Um, that this is a way that, you know, yes, we're using these visuals to be inclusive and to, to uplift students, but it's also an excellent gateway into some difficult content and can really help kids understand some of those differences in, in a pretty visceral way. Um, and then I do the Rufella story, which generally speaking, um, you know, Rufella is very, you know, uh, she gets painted as very whiny, kids are get kind of frustrated with her, which I understand. Um, but I also understand that as a, as a young Roman woman, it was drilled into her that you grow up, you run a house, you organize a social calendar, you go see people, your whole life is to see and be seen and kind of work your way up the social ladder. And then she's in the middle of the sticks I would complain a lot too if that were my if my identity were so wrapped up in this one form of life, and then to be removed from it, it's kind of cruel. Um, and I wanted kids to kind of understand that while also kind of looking at women more broadly because we don't see a ton of them. So we did this pre-reading where we talked about you know would you like to be in the city or the country? Where would you want to spend your birthday? What is this an image of? And credit here goes to Justin Slocum Bailey. Um, he does a lot of this in his pre-readings for some of Sulpicia's poetry. And I realized that a lot of it would work really well for the Rufilla story as well. Um, so that was how our sort of our entry point. And then I went from there into some vocabulary surrounding Roman women, uh, specifically Rufilla that I knew we were gonna see in the story. I knew my kids weren't gonna know what an ornatrix is. They're not going to remember crines and component, right? There's all these vocab um, words that were going to be sort of barriers to their understanding. So I brought in some images of a Roman matrona with her on Kili, with her um, ornatriques. We sort of talked about it. What do you see in the picture? What are they doing? What are they holding? What's going on? Um, and then when, when we kind of went through it a little bit more, showing what Roman women wore, showing some of their jewelry, showing some of that hair art and things, showing pictures, again, the fam portrait, how a woman looked when she was all dolled up. And then there's this amazing YouTube video that I found. This is actually a series um, that the English Heritage does of fashion throughout time. And there happens to be one um, depicting Roman Britain, the, the way that women were styled in Roman Britain. But it goes into archeological evidence, it goes into some history, 
um, is fascinating. And my kids were absolutely enthralled. And this class was mostly boys. I had a handful of girls, but I thought, oh, the girls will kind of enjoy this. And they did. But I had boys, like I had jocks who were like, let's start again. I went and watched the Regency one. That was, that was crazy the way they styled themselves. I'm like, right on. Like they just took it upon themselves to go watch more YouTube videos on women's fashion throughout time because they thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so you just never know what, what, what might sort of get a student curious and get a student to look into history a little bit more. Um, so this was all provided a great sort of entry point into Roman Britain, which is going to be something that comes up in the culture stages moving forward. It's a great way to sort of open kids' mind about Rufilla and sort of understand why she's complaining, where she's coming from, the isolation she likely feels. Um, and it, it just makes Salvius look like even more of a villain, which, you know, we all love making Salvius look like a bad guy. Not that he needs much help. Um, but this is how I've, I've chosen to sort of handle Rufilla and some of the, the issues um, with how women are represented in the Blue Book of Cambridge. Right, and it just brings out women so well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love, I love this. So, um, so for me, um, one of the things I did one time is we were working towards reading Ab Urbe Clombita, and I often make up weird stories to introduce vocabulary. This was one of my random stories. And so I made a micrologue, which is like you basically make up a story and that's ugly. You basically make up a story and um, then you draw pictures to go with the story. And then you actually retell the story. A student listens to you telling the story and has to retell the story. And the student, other students write down the story as you retell it. And it's a whole thing. So actually, I haven't done one of those in a bit. I think I might when I don't know when. Actually, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so, but anyway, one of the stories, this one has this, this whole story looks like a story between a prince and a princess. And he is definitely in love and he's going to go save her. Um, but then he's like, oh, there's this other girl. Never mind. I just like girls. Um, so he's like, I'll just go for her instead. But she tells him off. He's, she's like, E, go, right? Because she loves the princess. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's something small, but I actually had students really excited that we got rid of the prince in the story and just had the story between the two girls. And, you know, not all the stories have to, between, have to be between a guy and a girl. And that's really the main thing, is that don't be afraid to change that up and let it be a story between a guy and a guy and a girl and a girl. Um, when I was first teaching, again, 18 years ago, um, I did a lot of TPR storytelling, TPRS, and um, we... I would let the kids guide the stories and I've actually moved away from that because I find that their sense of humor can still be hurtful to others. So they would have guys love guys as a laugh and girls love girls as a laugh. Um, and I went with it because they were laughing and engaged and you know, you know, my kids knew I, I loved them. So it was fine. Um, and uh, since then I have of course moved completely away from that. Um, but it's just one of those things where I'd rather have this type of positive representation um, where, you know, it's a kind of a powerful couple at the end and, and not have, and not have the stories where we're playing it for a joke. So. Definitely. All right. And I guess I have the last one too. So I'll do this one real quick. This one's not long to talk about. For Andromeda, who is an Ethiopian princess, I went to Deviant Art, and you can see the that attribution right here because they have wonderful, beautiful art. Um, but I went to Deviant Art and um, got this picture of an Ethiopian Andromeda. It is meant to be Andromeda, and um, the thing is, is that a lot of art 
when you get to the Renaissance, Andromeda is always drawn as a white woman. Um, they got this from Ovid describing her as a marble statue, which we now know were painted. Um, but in his other writings, he calls her Flawa. He clearly did not intend for her to be considered white. He called her a statue because she was so beautiful and such an ideal of perfection of beauty. So, um, but yeah, so I've been making sure that every depiction I have of her is definitely not of a white princess. So. All right. And here's some additional resources that you may want to use in your classes. Um, I'm a big fan when I introduce mythology to students. I want them to learn the attributes of the gods and goddesses and how to identify deities based on those attributes. And then I came upon this photo series of the Olympians, but depicted um, by these Afro Latinx artists. And you can clearly see the attributes. You know, Zeus has his lightning bolts. Um, it's a very classical depiction of, of Zeus, except he's dark skinned, right? There are these just really captivating images. Um, there's, of course, Aphrodite. There's Apollo. There's a great one of a little Cupid. This is cute little sort of gap tooth boy. He's just adorable, right? Aries. We right? talk about the fact that maybe you might edit some of the pictures. So yeah, you could, you could them. definitely um, crop them close. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, and of course, if you're worried about it, don't use all of them. Pick, pick, pick one here or there that you really enjoy. Um, but, you know, I was even thinking about it. I know that whenever I do mythology, I show them black figure painting, base, you know, base paintings that people are nude. Um, yeah. You know, so I you sort of depending on the age of students you teach, depending on the culture of the school. Um, again, if you're not, if you're never quite sure, run it by a department chair, run it by an administrator. If you've got a diversity and equity inclusion coordinator, run it by them. You know, you, you don't have to make these choices on your own. Um, and, and that way, it, if you're not sure if something's going to fly or not, it lets you sort of take the temperature of the school and get a sense of what the climate is. You know, when I first started teaching mythology, I ran my slideshow by our head of middle school just to say, hey, I'm showing images of art, you know, depictions of gods and goddesses, how the Romans depicted them. Just want, want to make sure that that's okay. And he said, Oh, what are they going to be? And I was like, what you'd find in a museum, you know, he's, right. and he looks at, oh yeah, that's fine. I was like, yeah, I just, but you know, there's nudity. So want to make sure everyone knows. Right. So, you know, when, when, when in doubt, you know, ask people, you know, yeah. if they say no, find, find something, find something that, you know, engage them and say, well, what help me brainstorm something that, that would be um, appropriate for the norms of our community, but would still allow me to represent diversity you know, kind of bring people into that conversation. Um, that way it's not all on your shoulders. Uh, gods and color. Um, and there's actually a bunch of options for this, but this is a traveling exhibit that was in uh, Munich. And um, I just did a big theme with my Latin fours over the gods and color and polychromy. And um, I, really enjoyed exploring this with them. Um, I was not exposed to this concept until I was a full grown adult. I think it was like 30 and um, teaching for quite a while. So I am really glad to be exposing them when they are in high school so that they don't graduate with this knowledge. Um, they had full reflection journals. We read articles about um, white supremacists using um, white statues as the basis for for claiming that white skin was superior um it was uh, a really great um delving into this whole concept so these images they're useful for a lot of things absolutely and these are some poet illustrations by um an artist who goes by um, artfully on Twitter and her website, which I thought is what I linked, but apparently I, I linked both. these particular tweets. Okay. Um, 
so they're just depictions of the gods and are of these these poets and as you can imagine people on the internet had opinions about these poets being depicted with these skin tones um but i i love her style of art and this is her store where she has different prints and things and she's got some of those minoan statues but they've been painted in the roman goddess flora depicted there um her own take on attic uh, black figures and red figures so it's just kind of a neat way to show kids, especially if you have um, kids in your class who are passionate about art and who are themselves making lots of art, showing them how different modern working artists are um, reinterpreting the art from antiquity. Is, you know, you never know what, what that might spark for students and what sort of passion projects that might ignite for them, which is a pretty cool thing. Yeah, I think it's important to show them that that's okay. And yeah. that they don't have to portray it exactly as they've seen it portrayed. Um, I'm gonna let you talk about loop recall because it is is so much part of your thing. Yeah, I I am involved with loop recall. They are a Latin reading group dedicated to closing the gender gap in spoken Latin. But if you click on their materials, they have all manner of things. They have coloring sheets. Um, which is, I teach younger students, so it's a really fun, like if you've got kids who finish fast, give them, you know, you give them something to color. Um, and they celebrate different women Latinists throughout time. Um, these all go along with the Boccaccio de Mulieribus Claris. Um, but if you're looking for ways to incorporate more women, right, these are, they've got pre-reading activities, they've got um, activities to go along with reading them if you're interested, especially if you teach upper level Latin and you're looking for maybe ways to bring in some writing about women, um, this is a great place to look. Um, they're pretty reasonably priced. Lubricall is a nonprofit organization. Um, and I can tell you firsthand that the money that Lubricall makes goes right back into uh, empowering classicists and, and getting our materials to members and helping keep costs down so that people who want to join our book club don't have to buy things out of pocket. So it's, it's a great, uh, a great organization, in my opinion. Great. And then we just have some clip art of some kids with disabilities from Teachers Pay Teachers. So again, you can sort of find some imagery to display that is not um, kids who that aren't regular able-bodied kids you know these are all kinds of kids so if you're showing somebody going you can have them in a wheelchair somebody walking with a with a cane you know that sort of thing so. yeah and, and just normalizing the idea that there's not one way to be a regular kid that there's right, exactly. any kind of mobility any kind of you know any any yeah. any way you're living is the right way to live yeah. Um, and these, you know, this particular clip art is a little bit cutesy. It is a little bit childish. And in the past, I've always sort of been on the fence about using things that seem a little childish, but I've never had students complain about it. And let's be honest, middle schoolers will let you know if they think something is, <laughs> does not meet their standards. That's so um, and so, cause I think really they are, they're so captivated by the fact that it's an image they haven't necessarily seen before or and they're thinking about latin and they're you know they've got other things in their brain so i wouldn't be worried about using an image that seems a little bit more childish than the level you're teaching um and i i i wanted to include a teachers pay teachers ones in case you're at a school who has a subscription or if you you yourself use it um because i do find you know it's, it's a mixed bag of things but it may be worth it um, to spend a few dollars here or there for some clip art images that you know you'll have readily available and you don't have to do a Google search and try to find them. You just have them there and you're ready to go. Yeah, um, I mean, this is the so. thing. If you had that, you have some different religions available. You have, you know, I mean, when I did prayer recently, I included, you know, a person leaning over a prayer rug and, and a person with incense you know, so that we have more than one religion represented. I don't want to only represent one type of concept. You want to have all kinds of things. Definitely. Like, you know, 
religion. Put, I think putting someone to... wearing a hijab, you know, yeah, uh, it just included um, among your images of different people living yeah. their lives, doing different exactly. things. Um, you know, the, the more, again, the more types of people we can show the better because yeah. we want our classroom to reflect the communities that our, our students live in now, the communities that our students could live in later, and ultimately communities we would like to see, you know, I, ideally, all of these things become more normalized and, and become more second nature. Um, and this is just a small way that we can contribute towards, towards that future. Yeah, exactly. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide. So we're not gonna click on all these websites because they are chock full of stuff. But these are some good resources for furthering your education on these topics. Um, there's the BIPOC project, which gives you a good overview of sort of the term, what the project aims to do, its resources, its goals. It's laid out really nicely and it just makes a, a nice sort of introduction to why, why representation of black, indigenous and people of color matters. Um, similarly, the Center for Racial Justice in Education is designed to help teachers deal with issues of race when they come up in the classroom. I've been lucky enough to go to a couple of their trainings and they're just top notch. Um, the, the people who lead them are experts in their field. They're also very sensitive and understand that they're helping you talk about things that you may never have talked about before or things that could be scary to talk about for a number of different reasons. Um, and they give you practical takeaways to help you better handle situations when they come up in class um, and help you better understand your, your curriculum through different perspectives and through different lenses. So it's a, it's a really wonderful uh, center, a really wonderful resource for educators. Why we need to start seeing the classical world in color um, is a great, just sort of laying it out of what problems are caused by the whitewashing of the classical world and how it's used by white supremacists to support false ideas. Um, it's one of the articles that I assigned to my students um, and they really found it intriguing and thought provoking and their reflection journals were great because that's what I assigned them to do as they read through it. Um, you know, it, it's just, and of course this was like seniors, it's not something I gave to like freshmen, but it, it's just important to have these thoughts and these discussions, you know, it is really important to make sure that all kinds of people are reflected in the classics for more than just your kids. We need to also make sure that everybody is aware that this is how it is. Definitely. And then Sky Shirley has curated a list of woman Latinists throughout history. Um, again, if you're looking to include more types of voices in your curriculum, if you are at a point in Latin where you're done with the textbook and you're kind of pulling different things for students to read, um, it's not uncommon for students to have the misconception that women didn't write, you know, and that's simply not true. Women just haven't been included in the canon. Right. All right, so our conclusions. Um, the main thing that we want to leave you with is the idea that change is hard. We just talked about all the things you can do to change, but there, it's a process. You don't get to just start and stop, you know, change your curriculum, everything's okay. It's, it's a process. I've been doing this for years now, updating my curriculum to be more inclusive. Um, it, you start with seeing things you need to change. You figure out your steps. You put them into practice and see how they work. And you, you check in after a while to see um, your progress. Note things that you might be missing. And there's almost always things that you're missing. Okay, I included uh, more people of color in my PowerPoints, but I didn't even think about the fact that all of my families are nuclear families. I need to do something about that. So now I'm gonna change that. You know, there's, there's always a step that you aren't taking and that's okay. 
this it's about growing and making your classes better. Definitely. And you also don't have to immediately redecorate everything in your room, immediately redo every presentation you've made. Um, it, it's just not real. It's not realistic in general, and it's certainly not realistic while teaching during a pandemic. Um, <laughs> You know, pick, pick something that you're going to be doing in the next few weeks, you know, a, a resource that you've made, kind of look through it and think about images you can add here or there. It's not really about removing anything you've, you've got already. It's just about adding more to it to make sure that we can represent as many different types of people, as many different abilities, as many different family structures as possible to make sure that everyone understands that we understand that they are valued for who they are as they show up in the world. Um, and it's just fundamentally empowering to children right. to feel that way from an adult. And it feels really good as a teacher when you can be that adult for somebody. Exactly. We want to move them from unreflected to reflected status, but you don't have to just cover your room in mirrors. So, yeah. you know, one mirror at a time. Definitely. And I think we've got one more slide, which is, is sort of where to find us. So you can find me on Twitter at Magistra J. Yep. And I'm on Twitter at Rachel Keeney, which is just Latin for ashes. You probably already know since you're watching this. So I'm just so used to explaining that. <laughs> I wish there were a Latin word for jarnigan. I guess <laughs> it could be jarnigensis or something. But. Yeah. Doesn't quite flow as well. No. <laughs> All right, well, thank you all so much for your time. We hope you have found this um, beneficial, helpful, and we would love to hear from you if you've got any questions for us, if you have any other ideas for resources that you found really helpful. I know I would certainly love to see them. Yeah, please add to my it. repertoire. Yeah. <laughs>